Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask all people present to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent? I would say at this stage that Stuart Stevenson has submitted his apologies uh, due to ill health. The first item on the agenda is de a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking items three and four in private. Item three invites the committee to consider the fu its future work program, and item four relates to the committee's approach to, it, to its inquiry into aquaculture in Scotland. Are members agreed to take these matters in private? Yes. That's agreed then. We will then move straight on to agenda item two, which is on the Scottish Government's digital strategy. This session will take evidence on all aspects of the Scottish Government's digital strategy. And I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, Alan Johnson, the Head of Connectivity, Economy and Data Division, and Robbie McGee, the Head of Digital Connectivity Policy. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening statement? Well, thank you for the invitation to uh, answer questions on the work the Scottish Government is doing on digital connectivity. Our digital strategy sets out our approach to support a robust and world-class digital nation, a Scotland that is future-proofed both economically and digitally. Recent figures available show that Scotland's digital sector contributes around £4.5 billion to the Scottish economy. That's around half a billion more than the food and drinks growth sector, for example. And the importance of this sector will continue to grow and grow as uh, time goes on. Our digital strategy maps out how we will shape Scotland to become that world-class nation, vibrant, inclusive, open and outwards looking digital nation that we should be putting digital skills and technology right at the heart of everything we do. And that is exactly what we are doing. The Scottish Government has provided fibre broadband access to over 870,000 premises in Scotland through our Digital Scotland programme. We have launched our mobile, mobile action plan to improve coverage in Scotland. Uh, we have helped establish and support the growth of Scotland's first internet exchange. However, with Scotland having some of the most challenging locations anywhere in Europe for providing telecoms infrastructure, some in our communities still do not have access to superfast broadband. That's why we are committing £600 million to the Reaching 100, the R100 programme. This is the biggest public investment ever made in a UK broadband project. And it underpins the first universal superfast programme in the UK. The objective is that by 2021, every home and business in Scotland will have access to superfast broadband. That's the choice we in the Scottish Government have made, superfast broadband for all. That being said, superfast broadband is only one aspect of connectivity, and in conclusion, convener, I'm keen to explore the various strands of the wider digital strategy in the course of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The first question is from Richard Law. Yes, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Yesterday I received a briefing from Witch in regard to broadband in Scotland, and it says Scotland has made significant progress in coverage of superfast speeds. According to Ofcom's 2017 Connected Nations report, the greatest progress of any area in the UK. In light of that comment, can you tell me when will the Scottish Government achieve its intended goal of extending high speed broadband? to around 95% of premises in Scotland, and will this goal be achieved in all local authority areas? Uh, well, well, thank you. I think we have made significant progress in Scotland. And the very first point to make, and this is important to remember, we were starting from further behind in Scotland. We had further to go in Scotland, particularly because of the extent to which our country is based of, of rural areas, uh, but uh, which and other independent commentators uh, uh, have acknowledge that we have made significant progress and we have done so I think more swiftly than other parts of the UK in many respects. So far as the target goes I think it's important to, to clarify some misinformation that was put out I think by a Tory MP uh, recently. Our target has been to achieve 95% fibre coverage. Uh, the target has been I think quite deliberately misrepresented in, in some quite uh, <laughs> 
a, a misguided press statements recently, uh, but our target has always been for 95% fibre coverage target last year. Our figures are currently being assured, but Think Broadband, which is an independent uh, analyst, indicates that fibre coverage in Scotland at the end of 2017 was 96.6%. Uh, so in that respect, target is achieved. I don't know whether either of my colleagues can talk about the local authority aspect of the question before we move on. Yeah, I mean, just to say the 5% target from the outset was a, a national target, so it was across Scotland, across both contracts. Uh, those contracts do have a kind of minimum coverage level within uh, local authority areas. Um, so at the time when the contracts were signed, um, every local authority area would have a minimum of 75% coverage. Um, but it's obviously far exceeded that for the vast majority of local local authorities. And obviously now with the uh, the R100 programme being planned, that will that will drive coverage to 100% in every local authority area by 2021. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, Jamie, if you've got a follow-up to that, then I'd like to bring him. Or, well, sorry, Mike, if, you, if yours follow-up to that, then I'll bring you in, Jamie. So, so Mike. Thanks very much, Convener. Yes, I mean, the Minister's referred to the Think Broadband. I don't know if he's had an opportunity to read this morning's Press and Journal, reporting from um, the Think Broadband information, and it says the only constituencies in the north of Scotland to meet the 95% target were Aberdeen, North and South, and all the other constituencies in the north of Scotland were below the Scottish average of 93.4%. That's according to the report in the PNJ this morning. And if I may, at the same time, uh, Richard, we all got the same briefing from which, and actually I think Richard missed out something in the quote. If I can just read the, the full quote, it says, Scotland has made significant progress in covering the superfast speeds from 83% to 87% in the last year. According to Ofcom's 2017 Connected Nations report, it is the greatest progress in any area of the UK, but from a lower base. Scotland continues to play catch up and lags behind the rest of the UK with a 4% difference in the UK average. So I think it's important to get on the record the full quote and, and be interested to hear the, the Minister's reaction, but particularly to think Broadband's report in the PNJ this morning, um, it seems to contradict what the Minister's just said. Um, well, with respect, I, uh, I don't believe that it, it does. And the reason I say that is that Think Broadband are looking at Scotland as, as one entity. But, you know, obviously, the whole point is that in regional areas, the, there is still more work to be done. That's precisely why we have our 100. We have our 100 because we recognise that there is more work to be done in providing, uh, a, as far as possible by fibre, access to superfast broadband uh, for rural areas. There is much more work to be done. So it's no surprise whatsoever that the Press and Journal quite fairly will report that the areas where more work is to be done as a whole are in rural areas. And I'm absolutely delighted that uh, we are seeing, uh, particularly in the, you know, my own constituency and in the northeast, the focus of the resource of 600 million to the extent, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, gents, of 384 million of the 600 million is devoted to the North geographical lot. And therefore, uh, the focus will be very much on the constituencies to which Mr. Rumbles has referred and the northern constituencies that have so far been left out of the, the, the digital party, as it were. And the reason for that is that Britain, unlike Germany and France, has neglected to make regulations to require commercial providers to provide coverage in rural areas. Had there been such regulation, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But there hasn't been. And that's entirely, with great respect, a matter for Mr. Hancock and his colleagues in the UK government. They have failed to provide the regulation. Had they done so, then the commercial providers would have had to implement it. That hasn't happened. So that's why we have stepped in and we are acting in substitute of the UK and Mr. Hancock acknowledging the responsibilities. Mike. Thank you, Minister, but I think you've misunderstood my question because <clears throat> I'm not just concentrating on the rural areas of the north and our constituencies in particular, but both this morning's report in the PNJ quotes Think Broadband's latest report as saying the Scottish average is 93.4% and also the which briefing which all the members have received talks about 87% and yet you have consistently said that you've already reached the 95% target. So I'm only just simply 
trying to find out which is right. Is it the which report for Scotland which says 87%? Is it Think Broadband which says 93.4%? Or is it the government which says over 95%? And if it is over 95%, could you just perhaps explain how the government has reached that figure so that we have some idea of, of what's actually going on? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, broadly speaking, both are correct because uh, our target is in respect to fibre coverage and the figures that are, are, are referred to by Mr Rumbles relate to superfast super coverage. And it is correct that there has been the largest increase in access to superfast coverage in Scotland, but it's also correct that uh, there is still progress to be done. Uh, our target has always been fibre, uh, uh, and of course the figures to which Mr Rumbles refer to relate to the proportions of homes and businesses in Scotland that currently have uh, access to superfast broadband. So that, to me, uh, is a simple explanation of Mr Rumble's question. I don't know if officials can have anything to add to that before we move on, because it is, a, it is, a, sorry, sorry, it is a very important point, although I think I have clarified it. But Can, can I just ask well, you, have, just yeah. Cabinet Secretary, just to clarify that a bit more? So, will you, because I, I, I'm now confused. Um, that you're suggesting that 95% of coverage is on fibre, but only 87% is on superfast broadband. Is that what you're suggesting? Perhaps if you could clarify that, or, or Mr McGee might clarify that, it'd be... It'd be yeah, so so that's, that's broadly correct. I mean, I think the, the other bit of clarification around that is that the 87% superfast figure from Ofcom was published in December on their Connected Nations report. That is actually based around data that was extracted in the middle of last year. So it's not as up-to-date as the Think Broadband figures, which purport to be a lot more up-to-date and current. So, um, so again, that's another reason why there's a, a slight disparity in the Ofcom and Think Broadband numbers around superfast access. Mike? Yeah, <clears throat> that's very helpful. Uh, it does help to in indicate which of these figures are, are, are better and more up-to-date. Looking at it from the view of the consumer, and I'm speaking as a consumer as well as the MSP here. What I'm really interested in finding out is not whether something is fibre or superfast broadband or whatever it is. What I'm really interested in in my home is what speed I can get. And the accepted speed is 24 megabits, I think, either 24 or 30. It would be help more helpful to, to clarify everybody's understanding of this <clears throat> if you could refer to the speeds that people are getting. So. Oh, <clears throat> have 95% of the Scottish pop, uh, businesses and premises received the 24 megabits now, or, or, or have they not? I mean, I mean it's a genuine, I'm genuinely trying to find out what, what it is we're talking about here. So is it, and speeds, as far as I can see, is what the normal person in a household would, would, would want to know. So are we expecting 24 megabits per second as everybody is 95%, has it been achieved, or is it still to be achieved? Do you want to answer that? I'll come in on that. So, the 24 megabits per second is the super fast definition that Think Broadband and others are using, and we're using in terms of the achievement of super fast at the moment. Um, at the moment, that, as according to Think Broadband, which is, as Robbie says, is the most recent numbers, that is the 93.4% number. So, we're at 93.4%. So, that is a little bit, according to Think Broadband, we've no reason to think those numbers are greatly okay. out, of, right. out of place. 93. So, that is less than 95 which was the UK superfast target at the same point. So Scotland is slightly behind the UK as a whole at the moment. Um, the Think Broadband numbers published this week also showed that if you look back to, say, the start of 2012, Scotland was 19 percentage points behind the rest of the... Sorry, behind the UK as a whole in terms of superfast coverage. It's now 1.6% behind, and Think Broadband in talking about the situation of the nations across the UK, say that the, na the nations have closed the gap immensely, is the phrase that they used, to describe that move from about 20 behind to about, for Scotland, 1.6% behind on superfast. Now, as the Minister says, that's still behind, and it's still 6.6% uh, to go in terms of superfast, and that's precisely why the R100 investment is being made. If I could make one further point, then, is to obviously to contrast that once more with the Scottish, the, the DSSB 95% fibre target, which, because that is related firmly to the contract, that has to go through certain processes of validation. They're going on at the moment. At the moment, we fully expect that, we fully expect that process to show that that contractual target has been achieved. 
BT open rates have done what they agreed to do under that contract to reach 95% fibre coverage in terms of the work they do to put fibre in the ground. That's made a major contribution actually to the achievement of the UK, 95% super fast target. It's been the major contributor to the Scottish super fast coverage, making the dramatic progress it has made and that we look to continue through further stages of DSSB, gain share through 2018, and then, of course, the R100 programme thereafter. So okay, we're going to come back to speed uh, slightly later. Um, I just want to bring Jamie in and then move on to the next question, Jamie. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. Uh, I just want to refer back to the uh, part of the original question, which was, I believe, around when this will be achieved in all local author authority areas. One of the things the reports have thrown up is what is clear is a huge digital divide between rural uh, and urban Scotland. Uh, if you look at uh, which parts of the country are still achieving speeds of less than 15 uh, megabits per second, in Glasgow and Dundee, for example, that's 0.5% uh, of consumers, whereas in the Orkney and Shetlands, it's up to nearly 30%. That's one and a third of consumers are achieving speeds of less than 15 megs. So whilst we're talking here around speeds of uh, percentages around the 90 this and the 90 that. I think on the ground the reality is that many parts of Scotland are still uh, uh, suffering with uh, terribly low speeds and I think that's what perhaps they would like to understand is when are they getting super fast or fibre per se? Um, well for, first of all um, because of the Digital Scotland broadband programme uh, which as I mentioned in my introduction has provided access to super fast 870,000 homes and businesses in Scotland and has been, I think, by any standards, a very successful procurement, exceeding expectations with the gain share clause, enabling BT to plough back higher than inspected custom uh, in order to uh, connect uh, or provide access for connection to super fast even more homes. But the reason I mention that to answer Mr Green's question before passing to Mr Johnson and Mr McGee for the technical parts of this is, is this, that were it not for that programme, then some rural parts and islands would have had zero or very, low, very, very little access. For example, the Northern Isles and the Western Isles would have had zero broadband at all. I mean, that was the situation that we, her we inherited. Uh, and in Mr Green's own part of Scotland, the local authority figures show that uh, there was very substantial improvement as a result of the Digital Scotland programme of an investment of 400 million. But the fact is it's not good enough. It's not good enough, and that's why the R100 programme is designed to reach out to the remaining uh, individuals and businesses that lack super-fast broadband. That's the whole point. So uh, I thought I'd cover that generally, convener, and if there's technical answers, maybe Mr Johnson could extend them. Uh, well, just a couple of further points I, I might make. One is that about 30% of all premises in Scotland have achieved super-fast or fibre through DSSB. So we're talking about an intervention that's had huge play across Scotland. One, nearly one in three of every single premise in Scotland has received access to fibre broadband through DSSB. That's the scale of what we're talking about. And that is then reflected in some of the figures I referred to earlier about the progress Scotland is making, some of the commentary from um, Ofcom and from Think Broadband about that progress. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to the next question, which is Peter Chapman. Yes, thanks, convener, and uh, welcome to the panel. Um, the next big plan, the next big push is, is of course, as we've already heard, the R100 programme. Um, the 600 million, roughly, to be spent over a three-year period, as I understand it, starting next year. Um, there is nothing in this year's budget for R100, and I can understand why that is. But I do wonder how the Scottish Government intends to fund this programme. It, it is a substantial sum of money. Um, does the Scottish Government expect to receive a, a, some of that money from the UK Government? And if so, how much? And uh, how, do, how does the Scottish Government plan to fund the, 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 the balance of that sum, whatever that sum might be? Um, okay, well... The, the £600 million pounds has been committed by the Scottish Government from our, uh, from our resources. Uh, that's committed to the initial R100 procurement, and that's coming from the Scottish Government, all of it, with the exception of £21 million pounds from the UK Government. So the UK Government's uh, contribution convener is just 21%. Uh, it's just 3%, rather, at £21 million. 
is coming from the Scottish Government. Quite frankly, I think that's just not good enough. And I put that point to Mr Hancock when I met him in Edinburgh a couple of months back. And I specifically asked him then, and followed it up in writing, to make a more commensurate contribution. Uh, and we have not got an answer to that. And the reason I believe that that is fair is twofold. Firstly, telecoms is reserved to Westminster, as, <coughs> as we know, and therefore it is a Westminster responsibility, like defence or foreign affairs, uh, or public general taxation by and large. And secondly, because there was a, a larger contribution towards the Digital Scotland broadband programme, towards the £400 million. Um, so I do think that that's fair, but um, you know, we will continue to make the argument in the public realm such as this, and, and people will draw their own conclusions. But above all, you know, because it's so important now for Mr Chapman's constituents and my own and all of our constituents to, to, have, to be digitally enabled, whether they're running a and b, &B where internet access is essential, uh, whether it's for children's education to have access to the internet, uh, whether it's to run a small business from home in rural Scotland, which would be an enabling, <coughs> empowering thing in, in Ms. Ross's constituency, for example. Um, all of these uses are so important now that we, we determined, convener, that we, we couldn't wait um, for the UK government to step in with a fairer share we felt we had to act, and uh, it's a very, very substantial contribution that's been made. And lastly, I hope that I might come on to what we're doing in the interim convener, but perhaps this, this quite, because we're not doing nothing. There's lots of things happening in the interim, but uh, before R100 uh, is rolled out in practice, but perhaps I should just leave the answer there for the sake of uh, brevity. Mm. Well, I mean, you have answered some of that question in that it's a, it's a small percentage coming from the UK government. I would, I would you know, hope that you can persuade them to come forward with some more funds. I, I, I accept that. But I do wonder how the, the government will find their $600 million because what are you going to cut to, to find the $200 million a year? Because, you know, we, we all know that the money is scarce. And how... How do you f propose to find this, this cash? I, I can, it does concern me. Well, I've agreed with the Finance Secretary that that's the budget we have. It's been agreed by mm. my Cabinet, by the Finance Secretary, and we will deliver that. That's the way we do business. Of course, it does mean that, you know, precisely because the UK are putting in only 3%, that we have less money to spend <coughs> on, you know, roads and railway projects than Mr Chapman's constituency. And I would urge all Tory MPs to to get on board with the campaign to persuade the UK government to pay something nearly approaching a fairer share to date. I've, uh, in correspondence with several Tory MPs, invited them to do so. Uh, it's fair to say I haven't actually heard any uh, response from any of them as yet, but, you know, uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's await and hope. It's also very important to say that, you know, the gain share will mean that there's a lot of activity this year. There will be more homes and businesses that will be connected under the gain share provision whereby BT contracted that they would expect to get, I think, 20% of those that had uh, access would be customers of BT. That was exceeded, and therefore the, the contract was skillfully drawn so that they require to make a contribution to provide additional connections. And as well as that, convener, I fully expect that in towns and cities, where, after all, um, we don't want to displace the duty and commercial providers to do their job, and it's, you know, we don't want to let off the hook, if, as it were, commercial companies that by investing in laying access to fibre for, for broadband, uh, that they can then make a successful business out of that. And I fully expect that we will hear announcements from major players, uh, which will be good news for some of the towns and cities in Scotland. But that is, of course, convener for them to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Peter, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, there's a couple of supplementaries on this. I'd like to come to Gail first and then Fulton. Yeah, it was just to, to pick up, sorry, good morning, panel, Cabinet Secretary. It was just to pick up that funding issue. I, I know in the city deal, um, the Inverness and Region city deal, they've put some of that money aside for broadband um, infrastructure. And I just wanted to ask how the city deal funding works in with the R100 programme. Well, Gear Ross is absolutely correct that, uh, you know, the, the Highland Council have chosen for, it's the city and Highland deal, I should say, particularly to Ms Ross, it's not only Inverness city. Uh, so a city and Highland deal, I think it's correct to say. I, I reread details of it uh, the other day. Uh, and they believe that digital connectivity is an important part of that. And my, my colleague and friend Drew Henry, MP, has been extremely active in this regard. Um, so we are looking at the possibility of incorporating funds from city deals 
and we do expect substantial co-investment from suppliers. So, in short, we expect the level of funding will exceed 600 million, but these talks are at, rel at relatively early stages, uh, but they're being conducted with goodwill with local authorities. Okay. Uh, Fulton. Thanks, uh, Morning, Cabinet Secretary. You said earlier there about that we couldn't wait until the, the UK government uh, made some sort of offer. Did, did they give you <coughs> any indication when they might come to the table with an offer? Uh, none whatsoever. None. So, just to clarify then, the, the UK government on a reserve matter, were quite ha if the Scottish government weren't able to step in, were quite happy to allow uh, Scotland to suffer in terms of a lack of broadband? Well, I, I think, to be fair, I don't think the UK government would necessarily choose me as their spokesperson. But, I mean, we, we have had no response. I have repeatedly pressed Mr Hancock time after time again, and uh, I'm afraid I've drawn a blank so far. But, you know, I, I do think that when the Scottish Parliament is united, if we spoke with a united voice, including all opposition members, then, you know, the case is really unanswerable. It is. It's reserved. It's their responsibility. Why are they not discharging it? And it's very useful, convener, to have an opportunity to put these points across in the hope that you know, all our colleagues across all parties will join with me in saying, let's get a fair deal from our UK colleagues. After all, it's their responsibility. Um, full um, Cabinet Secretary, could you just clarify something for me, just so I understand it, is uh, the R100 uh, budgeted figure of 600 million, um, which, which has been discussed, is, is that all money coming from the Scottish Government, or will some of that 600 million be funded through gain share? Uh, I'm a little bit clear, okay. if, if, okay. If, and, and, and if it's not funded by gain share, could you explain to me, please, roughly what sort of figure of gain share you think you get on top of that 600 right. million? Okay, the, the 600 million is all coming from the Scottish Government, with the exception of the 21 million, uh, 3 per cent from the UK. So the Scottish Government are funding, if my mathematics are correct, 579 million. There is no gain share in that at all. Gain share is the it relates to the previous contract, Digital Scotland Broadband, or DSSB as, as it's known in short, and the gain share has applied to that contract, which has already been substantially rolled out, and that's the one that's provided 870,000 homes and businesses with access. Uh, uh, so when I refer to gain share, you know, what I mean is that that pre-existing two contracts, one that covered the Highlands and Islands and one the rest of Scotland, a total of over 400 million, um, is continuing to operate uh, beyond expectations, in part because of its success, and there will be a substantial number, therefore, of additional homes and businesses that this year, 218, will receive access to superfast broadband um, as a result of gain share in the previous contract. But that's got nothing to do with R100, which is entirely separate. Okay. So can I th thank you? That, that 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 helps me understand that. Uh, just a question then: that there will be from the 600 million pound investment some gain share benefit from that in the future, i.e., the next contract. Um, where will that money go, and and will it be continued to be used on promoting a, additional uh, connectivity, uh, i.e., from where it came? Sorry, which money are you talking well, about? Well, the, the £600 million pounds that the Scottish Government is investing, um, my question is, that will result in some gain share. I want to know if that gain share money will be used in increasing connectivity across the areas that need it post R100, or well, whether that money will go elsewhere. I mean, I mean it's, it's early days because we're at the relatively early stages of the procurement process. But let me, let me try and explain it this way. I mean, gain share is... is uh, uh, a, 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 an idea, really, that you know, if a broadband provider provides access by laying fibre or having subcontractors do that, and then gains lots of customers, the contract obviously should take that into account and make an assumption about what the expectation of gain from the contractor uh, is. Uh, and if uh, the two parties, the government and the contractor, in each of the three, geogra three geographical areas, reach a conclusion with the contractor about what a fair proportion, if you say connect 100 houses, would, would, would 10 be an expected customer rate? And if there's 15, then that extra five is the gain share and should be reflected in the contract because the, com the company is doing better than expected. Uh, so it's, a, it's quite a sophisticated uh, 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 process, but a simple idea 
and we therefore expect gain share to be incorporated in the contracts for R100 as well. But um, by the very nature of the, um, the types of homes and businesses in rural Scotland which we're seeking to connect, in, you know, as has been referred to Mr Rumbles in rural Aberdeenshire, there will be fewer customers. So I would expect that the gains from gain share will be lesser or lower, but there will be some. So, you know, I, I, I hope I've explained that uh, reasonably clearly, and if officials have anything to add, then well, that, that I, might help. I would probably only add the point that it's, 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 it's quite possible that gain share would have to work in a slightly different way in R100 than from DSSB, because DSSB was founded on the idea that we push this out as far as we can get, but there will be further to go, and then gain share allows us to go a little bit further. Whereas R100, we hope, we can't guarantee this, but we hope that the initial R100 procurement actually takes us pretty much to the full intervention area being provided for. So there may not... Oh, I do apologise. Uh, Mr Johnson, while you're adjusting your uh, media... <laughs> Um, I, I, I hope it's not an answer being texted to you. My, 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 my question is, is, once the contract is sorted out, the R100 contract is sorted out, it would be very helpful for the committee to understand where the money that will be generated from gain share or the equivalent, uh, how much that's going to be, what the estimate is, and where that's going to be used. And maybe we could just part that there rather than get laboured into that. Yeah. Peter, you, you have a uh, specific further question before we move on to the next batch. Yeah, I mean, it's still on the R100, but it's about the, the process it's going through, you're going through right now to, to, to put the R100 program into, in place and you know there's a there's a, a procurement exercise as i understand it going on just now uh, some sort of bidding exercise amongst the various uh, people that can deliver this i just wonder how that's proceeding uh, can you give us some details of how that's going forward and how successful you are and whether it is moving forward as you would expect <laughs> yes um, I, well the, the the contract notice was issued in uh, december and the response we've had, the market interest, the responses from potential bidders, which the market and the notice in the official journal of the European Union has generated, is, is in line, uh, convener, with our expectations. I, I should say that you know, we're in the process now, but prior to the commencement of the process, I did meet with a number of companies that we identified as potential bidders to indicate that we would welcome interest uh, if they wished to proceed. And, a lot of preparatory work was done. It didn't just start last December, obviously. Um, we remain confident that the level of ambition and funding will attract a range of bidders. I mean, remember that you know, this is not central London that we're bidding for. It's not the most attractive commercially, if you see what I mean in terms of the, the value and the scale of customers. This is the most rural parts of Scotland. So this is a challenging procurement in order to ensure that we attract bidders. It was for that reason, convener, that uh, in order to... Um, to increase the chances of obtaining competitive bids in each part of Scotland, that we divided Scotland into three geographical chunks, broadly north, central and south. <coughs> and uh, um, we uh, therefore seek to attract competitive bids and value for money for the taxpayer, of course, uh, a, as a result of that um, process. So that's where we are at the moment. We will issue an invitation to participate in dialogue next month, and the procurement remains on schedule for a contract award by early 2019. There's probably a lot more I can say, but maybe I'll just park it there and see if members want more information about the, um, about the latter half of the, of the procurement process. Um, to be honest, I would like a bit more information if the Cabinet Secretary can give it. I, I do understand you're in a process at the moment. There might be confidentiality issues around who's bidding and, and, and you know, how that's going. But if you can give us a bit more information, I certainly would welcome that. Um, well, <coughs> a, I, I, Cabinet Secretary, rather than ask you to go through it now, you might want to reflect on what information is appropriate to give us and write to the committee. Okay. Uh, and I think the committee would be satisfied with that rather than ask you to... To, to, to do that in fairness. Hey, well, fair enough, I'm in your hands. We'll, oh. We will do that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, the next question is from uh, Gail Ross. 
Um, yes, I wanted to ask about uh, transatlantic fibre cables. Um, I know that specifically there's one that comes from the Faroe Islands. It comes on shore in my constituency at uh, Dunnet Beach in Caithness. Um, why are we not accessing those? Is there a competition rule or is there any reason at all that we can't access them? Are you exploring any ways that we could possibly access them? Because I know that certainly the one that comes on shore at Dunnet is bringing a lot of benefits to Faroe and Iceland as well that it passes through. Well, um, I think Ms Ross has, has uh, gained, uh, uh, has raised a, a very important issue and, and evidence from other countries such as Ireland, Belgium and Finland shows that entire industries, entire industries involving banking, uh, fintech, software development, creative industries will cluster where conditions exist, uh, where, where there are um, s sufficient uh, fibre crossings and the lack of direct international connectivity through subsea fibre does, I think, leave Scotland overly dependent on England for the connection, connect for these connections to the rest of the world and specifically on London as the only tier one global internet uh, a, a route which Scotland is directly uh, connected. So establishing an alternative resilient route could increase um, the economic opportunities for Scotland uh, and the overall performance of our networks as well. We are working with the digital team at Scottish Futures Trust to explore opportunities. The scale of these projects is such that they are rare and they're driven by private sector operate operators on purely commercial uh, uh, grounds. Uh, and we have, we have no firm plans to invest in any specific projects at this point, but, um, but we are continuing to take an active interest in this matter through Scottish Futures Trust. The specific point about the Sheffa cable that was referred to, I think in some ways that emphasises the point that the Cabinet Secretary was making because that hits the Scottish mainland and essentially goes straight down to the London, the internet exchange in London, with very little benefit for Scotland. And I think what we are attempting to do is to try and change that dynamic by establishing the internet exchange that was referred to earlier, by trying to kind of strengthen the, the quality and the, the robustness of data centres in Scotland so that more and more traffic can be retained. Uh, within Scotland, so it's it's certainly an area that we are we're really interested in, and I think I've made some real progress in recent months yeah. uh, in terms of engagement with uh, the commercial sector in this space. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Colin. You know, <clears throat> good morning to the, the panel, Cabinet Secretary. As you said earlier, your 95% target is for fibre coverage, obviously not um, super fast broadband, and in, in rural areas about 20% of premises won't have super-fast broadband speeds of over 24 megabytes per second, never mind the, the 30 that, that, that you look for in, in R100, um, when, when you actually reach that 95% target. So does the Scottish Government have accurate information on the location and number of rural premises that, that won't have access to super-fast broadband when you reach that 95% uh, fibre target, uh, and also the location and number of properties that will require direct government intervention to have access to super-fast broadband when you roll out R100? Well, well broad, broadly, yes, is the answer to that. We have undergone an extensive consultation process with the market uh, and the public in, in recent months to identify and verify the intervention area for the R100 programme. Um, that uh, process is called an open market review. This has been a, an enormous exercise. Um, and uh, it's demonstrated there are around about 240,000 premises that won't have super fast broadband access delivered either commercially or via DSSB. In other words, we have to look at what you know, private sector operators are going to do. We have to look at what has been done and will be done under Gainshare under the DSSB contracts. And that then uh, it helps us define the specification for the R100 contract as the, re the remainder, if you like, uh, that uh, we are reaching out to. So, um, I, so, I, so parts of rural Scotland are obviously amongst the most difficult areas in Europe to deploy telecoms infrastructure and deliver these services sustainably. And, and therefore, you know, the case for public intervention with the investment of £600 million the Scottish Government is planning to make is, uh, I think, a strong one. Given that, obviously, there is that digital divide and, and many of these rural areas are being left behind because they don't have access to super-fast broadband, despite some of them actually being within that 95% target, 
In terms of the rollout of R100, what are you doing to, to, to make sure they are prioritised first so they've actually got a competitive advantage instead of the current position where businesses in rural areas are, are being left behind? Well, that's a very fair point, and the answer is that in R100 we seek to prioritise the rural areas first, uh, taking an outside-in approach, as it were. Um, I mean, there's no point in, in going to those premises that are in towns or cities that don't have access to super-fast broadband first because they are types of, of uh, instances where we would expect commercial development to, uh, to deal with that issue. And indeed, every day I, I'm involved in, almost every day I'm involved in responding to individual requests. So it's an outside-in approach that we are, we are taking. We're aiming to, to tackle those uh, areas that have uh, most disadvantage, dis digital disadvantage, and that will be the initial priority approach for R100. I think it's probably fair to say that the, that the current Community Broadband Scotland initiative hasn't been a, a road in success. So when will you be carrying out a review of the approach that you take to enabling the development of, of community broadband projects in some of these rural areas? Um, well, we did undertake a review of how best to deliver support to community broadband projects, and, and we did conclude that despite uh, several successes. The CBS model wasn't the best one, so a dedicated team within HIE will help support community projects in future. The investment being delivered through the R100 programme is a real game changer, and it's right that the delivery landscape reflects that. And there's another point that we want to ensure that the R100 programme doesn't kind of overbuild any community network that's either currently delivering superfast broadband or has firm plans to do so. And obviously, that's a corpus of work that we've been, uh, we have been pressing ahead. There, uh, the, 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 there are some community projects that are definitely going ahead. So we need to, uh, we need to ensure that the, the R100 programme doesn't duplicate the, that, that effort, uh, convener. Colin, let's see. Okay, the, the next question is from Fulton. Convener, uh, I wanted to ask a Cabinet Secretary about universal service obligations. How will the Scottish Government ensure that its own uh, universal ser service obligation of 30 megabits per second is enforced, and how f future proof is this for the future needs of consumers and businesses in Scotland? Um, well, we've, we have no, um, you know, because a, a, a broadband telephony is a reserved matter, we, we don't have any legal powers to, uh, to enforce or implement the US, so that, that is reserved to the UK and it's for Ofcom to implement and enforce. Uh, we do, uh, Ofcom have a, an office in Princess Street in Edinburgh and have had uh, several engagements, meetings with, with their, their team there, uh, but we don't have the legal powers. Uh, but uh, we, we have uh, set as the standard USO of 30 megabits per second via the R100 programme precisely because we, we, we think that that's necessary in order to equip people and businesses in rural Scotland with access to the internet with that sort of speed capability. And we do think that 10 megabits per second, which is the level of speed that the UK government are looking at, is, is, is really not good enough. And that's why we have picked um, 30 megabits per second. Um, we work very closely with Ofcom, and members may be aware of the work that Ofcom have done a couple of years ago in actually costing the difference between 10 megabits per second and 30 megabits per second. Uh, and that, that is an area of inquiry that may now become even more interesting to, uh, to drill down on. I don't know if officials have anything else to add on that. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, think it's just, yeah, I think it's just worth um, just drawing the distinction between uh, the universal service obligation as a regulatory tool that's taken forward by Ofcom and, and the R100 programme. So the USO process, UK government's decided it'll be 10 megabits per second USO at UK level, which will be taken forward now by Ofcom. Uh, the R100 programme obviously is, is separate to that and in some degrees will negate, negate um, the need for the USO to apply extensively in Scotland or at all. Um, obviously, from our point of view, enforcing 30 me megabits per second through the R100 programme will be around contractual mechanisms and what we agree with the supplier or suppliers that come through the procurement process. Um, but obviously, as the, the Cabinet Secretary said, we're still really keen to engage with Ofcom on that design of the, the UK-wide USO, um, particularly because, obviously, um, 
depending on how that's funded, it could actually fall on consumers by and large to, to fund it. So you could find that Scottish consumers are actually paying for a 10 megabits per second USO UK wide. And I think on that basis, we would expect to see Scotland see some tangible benefits from the, the USO process. So we're, we're starting that process of engagement with Ofcom and, and the UK government around that now. And, and picking up what you said there about um, it, it might be that the USO doesn't, doesn't apply at all. How confident are you that, that that might be the case? Or what sort of, um, if the USO is to apply, um, you know, how, what, what sort of figures are we talking about? Or is that not data that you've got? Well, it really it will depend upon the timing of when the USO is implemented at UK level. Um, clearly, if it's before 2021, then there may be some parts of Scotland where R100 has not yet reached in terms of where they are in the deployment that may not have 10 megabits per second at that point and wouldn't be disqualified in any way from, uh, from going forth and, and, and trying to benefit from it. Um, but clearly, we're not clear on the timings. I think the, the regulatory process around implementing a USO is quite lengthy. It will involve a lot of consultation on various elements of the, the design of that. Um, so it may well be that the timings broadly align, actually, and it is kind of 20, 2020, 2021 before the USO is actually in place at a UK level, at which point that scenario that was painted where actually the USO, USO may not apply because there's widespread availability of 30 may actually come to pass. Okay. I should say that we have urged the UK Government to set up a USO working group involving the UK Government, Ofcom and the devolved administrations. I think this would be an effective way, convener, of ensuring that the USO is developed in a way that benefits all parts of the UK. So that was suggested some time ago, and the committee might be interested in that in case it feels that that would be a useful thing that, that might uh, help everybody in, in the UK make progress. Uh, Jamie, you wanted to come in or follow up on that? Thank you very, very briefly. It's just following on from uh, what Fulton McGregor said and the response given from the panel. Uh, my understanding of the uh, USO is that it's a, uh, a proactive process in the sense that the consumer will uh, apply for connectivity and the universal service ob obligation provider will be obliged to build the infrastructure to deliver that service up to a maximum threshold, um, whereas the R100 process seems to be more of a, a passive or a reactive process, in which case, uh, is there any sense of confusion amongst the consumer that there are two parallel processes, albeit with different uh, target speeds, um, that are taking place concurrently by two separate uh, organisations, two separate governments? I mean, what sort of day-to-day -day discussions does uh, the team at Digital Scotland have with DCMS or Ofcom to ensure that there is a, a joined-up approach to those two distinct schemes? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's a real concern in our part that the public may be uh, confused by two parallel processes, which is why we have engaged or attempted to engage uh, extensively with DCMS to this point. And to be fair, when they were going through the process of determining whether it would be a regulatory USO or whether it would be a voluntary USO with, with BT, um, there was good dialogue around that. Um, and we're obviously looking to continue that now that the, the, the kind of baton has passed to Ofcom to actually go ahead and, and implement the, the USO. So um, we're in the process of kind of setting up a, a, you know, a detailed workshop with, with Ofcom around that to have a date soon. Um, and part of that will be very much around aligning some of the messaging around that. Um, I mean, we've obviously said in, in response to previous USO consultations that we think actually the USO could be designed slightly differently. So it's not a kind of such a demand-led approach that there is an element of infrastructure investment that underpins it because I think the, the point that, that might impact the effectiveness of a USO is what infrastructure currently exists right across the UK. So if, if underlying fibre is not there, then probably the only option open to people is satellite broadband, whereas our view that's been expressed is that if the USO is a mechanism of enhancing that underlying fibre infrastructure across the country, then it actually enables a genuinely demand-led USO with various different technologies coming into play to, to, to be brought in. So, um, so again, that's, it's these sorts of areas that we're keen to discuss with Ofcom and the UK government. And obviously, um, as part of that, the messaging for the public um, will, will feature. I think there's a, a, another issue here, which is that, um, as Mr Green has, has highlighted, that you know, if um, the UK approach is that people ask for a service, then you know, what happens when they move house? Uh, and then the next occupants of that house find that they're in a house that hasn't got access. I mean, that then means that a solution has to be found. Somebody has to come back and do the work again in a particular area. It does seem a little bit ad hoc in, instead of a universal approach where 
everybody is provided access, and that's an investment for the future for all homes and businesses, not just those who, at the particular time, the current occupants decide to avail themselves of an opportunity. So, so you know, that's a sort of practical common sense point that I think it tends to suggest that the Scottish Government approach is to be preferred. Thank you. Uh, the next question, Mike. I'm finding this session very helpful in the much that I'm understanding quite clearly what's, what's going on. I, I, I am, however, confused. One other area which I hope you can help me with. Um, the distance from uh, the exchange to an individual household. Um, it's been put to me that... Um, I've got a question, really. If I just take... I'm looking to do this, but I, I know my own example best. Two years ago, super-fast broadband cable was put along the road in front of my house into the village uh, of Kildrummy. And I thought that was great. And then I find out that, actually, I'm, I'm not getting super-fast broadband because uh, I'm too far from the green box, even though the cable goes right past the house. So this obviously applies to lots of people in rural Aberdeenshire. And my question is, am I counted? Is my household counted as one of the 93% where the broadband has gone to the green box and therefore that's it? Or am I counted as one of the 7% who are still to get that facility? I wonder if you could be helpful and explain that. Um, well, can I just make a general point and then ask Robbie to <coughs> answer the specific point about Mr Rumble's own home, which we... I have to say we haven't individually researched, but uh, no, no. Uh, I'm but just I, using it as an example. But the for general many... point. I mean, the general uh, point. I think is to be made, and I'm, I'm not a technician, but I think the long lines issue that does relate solely to delivery of broadband over copper, and traditionally that mm -hmm. was how broadband was accessed in the UK mm -hmm. with BT as the yeah. as, as the company that laid the access using copper, and the the conductivity qualities of copper are limited, so that the, the uh, effectiveness, the speeds drop as you become more distant from the um, cabinet. Uh, our um, plans as, uh, will require uh, fibre to be the main route of providing access to superfast broadband. And fibre can provide, as I understand it, uh, uh, a, a almost limitless speeds. Uh, and when I mentioned future-proofed earlier on, the R100 programme is intended to provide speeds at super fast now, which is 30, but in times to come, it, it is, should be capable in most instances of being upgraded to even further speeds. So I think it's a copper fibre distinction mm. primarily. But the second question is, you know, are you one of the included mm. or excluded? I think Mr McGee is going to answer that one. Yeah, obviously without knowing the individual mm. uh, case, but the, the principle of it will be your, if you cannot receive 30 megabits per second at your premise, that premise will not be included in any super fast coverage figures, so you would That's be part right. of the seven. The, the distinction would be that if, you were, if your premise was connected to a fibre-enabled cabinet, you would count towards the DSSB programme target, which is the fibre broadband coverage, but you wouldn't be included in any superfast coverage figures and would be included in the R100 intervention area accordingly. So they're on R100, so when we say to every premise, that actually means, it means what it says on the tin. It means to every premise, not just to the green box. Is that, that right? Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the, the green box, the connection via cabinets <coughs> is really just, in some ways it, it relates to the way that BT Openreach delivers broadband services, which is obviously via local exchanges, cabinets, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, depending on the outcome of the procurement process, that may well continue, albeit I think every supplier has indicated to us that you know, the, the issue of long lines is well known and that you know, in rural areas, full fibre will increasingly be the, the technology that is, that is preferred. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it will depend very much on the outcome of the procurement process around the extent to which cabinets and the way that the DSSB programme has worked will, will continue. Well, I, I, was, I was, sorry, I was just, I was happy then and I'm just all a bit confused now. I mean, can I just jump to the end of the R100 programme? Are we saying that someone in a house like mine, which at the moment doesn't, I mean, I get eight, I mean, at the best, eight megabits per second, at the best. So. In four years' time, would my household and others like it be getting a minimum of 24? That's basically the question yes. that we need to know. So that's going, that is definitely going to happen. Yeah. That, that's great. I think you mean three years' time. 
2021. In four years, the end of 2021. We've got four years less one month. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I mean, fair to the Minister, it's three years and 11 months, isn't it? Um, it's, it's, Mr Rumbles is absolutely correct, and I've never, I don't think I've ever said that before. <laughs> <laughs> Minister, there's a first time for everything. Um, I've got one more question, which is related to the brief we've been asked to give. Um, Ofcom expects to publish its final decision. It's, we've got Ofcom, by the way, before us next week, so it's helpful to hear what you have to say for the question. Ofcom expects to publish its final decision in its market review in a statement early this year, with new regulatory measures taking effect from the 1st of April. So my question is, how will Ofcom's regulatory proposals, when they arrive, help the Scottish Government's digital strategy? Um, I, I, I don't think there would be any difficulty with... with that I think there was a perceived difficulty in, in the UK, potentially in the recommendations, but when the UK were pursuing their contract with uh, 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 with BT, which of course has, has fallen through, but um, uh, but but certainly the you know the, the regulatory environment is is essential to the success of our strategy uh, uh, and how the how Ofcom re regulates the wider market can have, um, as I mentioned earlier, a critical impact because you know they dictate what has to be done by commercial bodies and that's why in this area I think regulation assumes an importance convener that uh, is not perhaps readily um, astute uh, uh, under uh, stood there are some things that the UK uh, government and Ofcom could do in the coming months which would be setting more stringent coverage obligations on mobile operators for example as part of the forthcoming 5G spectrum auctions. I mean, we want the spectrum auctions to require coverage in rural areas and take this sort of German outside-in approach rather than leave the rural areas, as Mr Green pointed out, in a, uh, in a relative state of sort of digital disadvantage or poverty. So, so that we haven't touched on mobile yet, but I think it's very important for rural areas where getting a signal is, uh, is a bit of a challenge. Um, we, we are about to move on to mobile areas. Can I just ask a question? I mean, I think we've all been approached by people who, who are struggling with broadband. And, and it's a point that the, this committee's made before, is what people really want to know is when they're going to get superfast broadband, when it's going to be delivered. Because some people can't wait if they're right up to the end of uh, 2021. On the basis that the contract, I believe, the Cabinet Secretary said will be awarded in early 2019, which means that there will be two years to complete the contract, is part of the contract going to enable the Cabinet Secretary to tell people in areas when they can expect to get the superfast broadband that they're looking forward to getting um, and they don't know about when that will be. But will you be able to tell them at that stage? Um, I think we're going back to the Mr Rumble's point. I think it's actually three years from the start of 2019, um, if you see what I mean. Wow. But, but uh, 19, 20 and 21. Okay. Uh, so at uh, the end of 21, so there's three years within which to complete the, the, the task. But to answer your question, um, you know, we, we should cer certainly be in a much clearer position as to what is being proposed uh, once the contracts are um, uh, awarded and the the coverage footprint to be delivered by the successful R100 bidders, you know, can by definition only be confirmed at the end of the procurement process, which it, we expect to be around around the end of this year. Um, I mean, the procurement, the aim, I must stress this, is to extend new fibre backhaul to all corners of the country. But we will certainly, I mean, the convener's point is an extremely fair one. It's raised by people every day. We will uh, wish to communicate the precise detail as early as possible to the public so that they can understand what infrastructure will be deployed in their area. But you know, I would just go back to a point that I, I think should be made. This is an infrastructure project. Um, it's not like buying something from a shop. Uh, the infrastructure project involves five stages. It involves, uh, a, it involves a survey, design, build, connect and activate. Uh, each of these is a stage of infrastructure, just like constructing a road or, or a new railway. It does take time. And I say that not as, a, as an apology or a mitigation, just as a reality. Uh, and we, we have to explain that and be honest about it, that it does take a bit of time. But we should be in a position early next year to provide a lot of information about who will be connected. And therefore, uh, that will be a step forward. Of course, those that are not in the plans will, at that point, I imagine, you know, um, make their views known 
But that's why we, we have the objective of connecting everybody by the end of 2021, which is ambitious, but we, we believe deliverable. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And, and, and I don't want to labour the point. I, I, I read the program, program for government, which is clearly stated that the Scottish Government said uh, by 2021. It doesn't say by the end of 2021, but thank you for clarifying that it is by the end of 2021. We're going to move on to the mobile access plan, and the first question will be uh, on that will be from Mr. Lar. Richard. Yes, thank you. Vina, um, mobile access plan. Scottish Government published its Mobile Connectivity Action Plan. The Scottish Government is going to work with Scottish Future Trust and the mobile industry to develop a 4G mobile info programme. Um, Scotland has one of the most beautiful landscapes in the world, glens, hills, um, which are not suitable for mobile phone reception. There remains large uh, areas of Scotland landmass which is not possible to receive a mobile voice or mobile data service. What are we doing to resolve that? What progress has been made in addressing the mobile <coughs> not spots? And can the Scottish Government what can the Scottish Government do to encourage mobile operators to provide better coverage for more mass in areas where it's impossible to receive a sig signal? Well, this again is hugely important, and uh, and that uh, and first of all, um, we nice. were were the first uh, country in the UK to establish a mobile a action plan, um, where we set out a variety of, of methods that we wanted to deliver um, better mobile coverage throughout Scotland, or adequate or some mobile coverage throughout Scotland. Um, I think Wales have now brought forward their own plan. I think they started that in October. But we were a bit ahead of the game. Uh, and one of the ways in which we achieved the objectives that Mr Lyle correctly sets out as being necessary uh, was to legislate to relax um, the planning rules to extend permitted development rights to enable masts to be put up more quickly. And I have to say, this is really, as far as I know, been embraced by local authorities uh, with vigour and enthusiasm. And uh, that's perhaps because um, our constituents are very keen to have that access, so they want the process of, of mass being put up to be undertaken as quickly as possible. And I know that in the Highland Council, uh, the attitude and the work has been excellent by the Highland Council officials in dealing with the uh, various uh, players. So that's one aspect. We're also trialling non-domestic rates relief in a number of pilot locations for new mobile masts. And I think the main uh, substantive answer is to Mr Lyle's series of questions is that um, this year, we are implementing, at a cost of £25 million, our 4G mobile infill programme, in which that sum of money will be invested to deliver improved mobile coverage. We have publicly consulted on a proposed intervention area. We will commence procurement around February or March with the contract award around the summer. The tender will be launched with 16 initial sites. Uh, with the ability to add additional sites to maximise the use of the £25 million funding. And we estimate, convener, that this should finance the um, putting up of around 50 to 60 sites uh, in total, though the final numbers will be dependent upon the outcomes of the procurement. There's a lot more, but maybe I could just pause there to see if there's other specific points that I may not have answered from Mr. Lyles, no, I think you've driving up to my son's one day going towards a boy, and I saw one of the tallest masts I've ever seen um, located on a hill. So I take it from what you're saying that 25 million, you're looking at sites to ensure that uh, these masts will uh, in, in, uh, improve the the connectivity for people who want to use the mobile phones in, in areas which are. You know, um, Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, with respect to my colleague, um, uh, uh, Mr Rumbles, you know, is uh, very iconic uh, and beautiful, um, but, un but unfortunately uh, is very hilly in certain areas. So I take it we're going to improve the connectivity. Um, a, I'm not quite sure I understood the question. I was kind of mesmerised by the reference to Mr Rumbles, but... Um, uh, but yes, we do want to, rural areas to have 
their non-spots or indeed kind of complete lack of, of access coverage dealt with. And that's why we're having this mobile infill programme. This is not intended, again, to supplant investment by private sector operators. It's intended to get to rural areas. And, um, uh, and therefore, that's, that's why this, this programme is going ahead. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think it is important just to, to, to make the point that our infill programme cannot deliver coverage to all mobile non-spots in Scotland, but the funding will be targeted where the most impact can be delivered. Uh, mobile non-spots will remain. So, you know, there, there are other uh, things that will need to be done to tackle um, this, uh, uh, this problem as well. And we appreciate it. So it's a very serious one for a great many people. Thank you. Uh, John Finney. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary panel. Uh, I'm a very non-technical person, but I do understand the term 4G. With 5G coming, uh, I'm advised, and can I commend the outside-in approach that you alluded to, Cabinet Secretary? You, are you able to say how much of Scotland will be 5G ready prior to the spectrum being made available, please? Um, well, we, we, we are kind of establishing a Scottish 5G hub to position Scotland as a testing ground, um, and that means the key elements that underpin the future success of 5G can be developed and trialled. Um, you know, we, we are urging the UK to take the, the right leg regulatory approach, and we have been for some time, actually, certainly since I uh, became the Cabinet Secretary, uh, so that rural areas are not um, overlooked. Um, at this stage, we haven't committed any funding towards the development of 5G because it's a, a reserved issue. The UK has committed £740 million to jointly support 5G and local fibre um, networks. Um, so it's, it's, it, it, this, this is obviously um, a hugely important new wave of improved um, mobile um, a enablement and connectivity. But we're not at yet at the point where I think I could answer the questions that uh, Mr Finney has asked at this point. But I don't know if... Robbie can add to that. Mr. Yeah, I mean, I think um, all I would say is that in terms of the, the 5G landscape, a lot of that will be set by the regulatory environment. So Ofcom is preparing to, to launch kind of auctions for the spectrum that will be quite important to 5G delivery. And I think from our point of view, the conditions that are attached to that, and in the past, it's this perennial kind of uh, tension between how much revenue is generated by the auction and how much coverage obligations or any other conditions that Ofcom might attach to the auction. I think that will be really, really important. Obviously, what we are doing at local level, the, the Scotland Innovation Partnership that's been mentioned, we're working with industry, we're working with academia to start to think about rural locations in particular, other new ways in which 5G could be delivered and supported. And I guess in the first instance, what we're keen to do is to develop proposals that can go and benefit from the UK, the substantial UK government funding that's been, been announced in this area. So that's, that's very much the kind of focus for us, a twin track thing of attempting to, to see Scotland benefit from the UK government investment and to attempt to influence the, the Ofcom uh, position around auctions. John. Uh, and forgive me here, stressing that I, I'm not technical. Uh, is it often with these things, it's the case that the rich get rich and the poor get poorer. So if you have something, it can be enhanced. If you don't have something, you continue. Is there any potential that we could see a situation that areas that, for instance, at the present time don't have the level of 3G coverage could somehow skip up if this outside-in approach were adopt well, we, to be we, adopted? We, we are, I think to, we are future-proofing our approach in the current broadband and mobile programmes to ensure that our investments can support 5G in the future. In other words, the R100 uh, and 4G uh, investments are being delivered in such a way as they, they can be improved in the future when we go to, to 5G. It was, it was a bit disappointing that the UK government, through their project, uh, um, failed project called the Mobile Infrastructure Project, uh, planned to deliver 84 sites in Scotland. I'm afraid they only actually delivered three. Um, and uh, you know, that, that was a, obviously a catastrophic failure on the part of the UK government. So that makes it all the more important that we get our procurement right in our mobile infill programme this year in the ambitious targets that I've explained to the committee. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, John. I, I'm now actually going to change uh, just it round slightly. I'm going to bring Peter in because of this. Uh, it seems more sequential. So mm. Peter and then followed by John Mason. Um, thanks, convener. I mean, uh, you have touched on it, Cabinet Secretary, in an earlier answer about how, we, how the changes to the planning rules and regulations are going to impact on the 
ability to, to, to deliver better uh, mobile communications. Can you just uh, t tell us how the changes to the new electronic communications code will assist the deployment of the di digital infrastructure in Scotland? Um, well, I think there's really two aspects to that. There's one which is reserved, one which is devolved. I mean, I've referred to the use of devolved powers, which are our responsibility and where we have taken action. We've taken action and permitted development rights. And I think, you know, the mood of the public in, has been that, um, you know, whereas maybe 15 years ago there may have been some objection to this, there was concern about mobile mass and <coughs> potential health, image, health damages. And those of us, you know, convener, I like mentioned names that are longer than the tooth, will, will quite sure remember that. But I think the, the attitude has flipped now so that people want coverage as soon as possible. And, Therefore, they understand that the masks are to be welcome. So, um, so we have, um, uh, therefore, used our powers to try to advance that. And we're working with the operators to see, you know, in a practical sense, what more we can do. Uh, and that's why I've spent some time in meeting them and working with Ofcom as well, who've been extremely helpful in all of this too. Um, the second part is re relating to the Electronics Communication Code, which Mr Chapman rightly mentions, and that is is a reserve matter, so it's not within our purview, unfortunately, but we have been broadly supportive of the reform of the Electronic Communications Code. It's only been operational for um, about over a month, so it's a bit early to make an assessment of the effect of the new code on telecoms investment, but we do expect that rental values will, will move downwards over time, and we are keeping a close eye on that. And, um, you know, we're, we're aware also that landowners, including public sector landowners, have expressed concerns about lower rental values arising from the implementation of a code. And I think SLE and the NFUS are, uh, have been involved with that. But broadly speaking, you know, we, we want to see the process moving forward because, as I think Mr Chapman is probably hinting at, uh, you know, that's a way to tackle the problem as quickly as we can and provide the the, the uh, access to uh, uh, coverage as quickly as we can for our constituents. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I am very supportive that, that, that we, we can drive forward these, these uh, de de developments. And what about planning changes? What planning changes has the Scottish Government introduced or plans to introduce to assist uh, in its infrastructure deployment, if, especially for new housing and, and, and new business developments? Um, well, I've, I've mentioned uh, earlier the permitted development rights for the masts, but we have also, I think particularly through building um, regulations, it's really it's the, the more um, appropriate method of regulation within which to determine this, because building regulations actually say, you know, how a house must be constructed, what standards it must be applied to. Planning is kind of where the houses go, really. Um, uh, to, in, in, in that respect, but we, we have taken steps to ensure, um, convener, and I haven't got the detail in front of me, I can write to you with this, that, uh, uh, that certainly larger housing developments that are built must be provided with access to super fast broadband. It's not, I don't think, the developer's responsibility fully to, to connect and activate in individual homes, uh, but providing access to large scale developments is now mandated by the building regulations. I recently um, met a, with a variety of players uh, uh, urging that we move to allow smaller housing developments to be a, a, in receipt of the, the same attention as well. So, you know, so this, this is an area that uh, is quite correctly raised by Mr Chapman and it's an area where we, we are using our powers to, to try to ensure that new buildings, mm. uh, whether they be homes or business premises, you know, are not left out. They are digitally, um, uh, digitally provided. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the next question then is Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Um, sticking on the topic of technology, I, I presume that the uh, R100 project, um, which I appreciate is going through a, a, a tender or a, a procurement process at the moment, uh, will be uh, made up given the nature of the delivery, a mix of technologies. Could anyone in the panel give more information on what that potential mix of technology might be and if any of it will include full fibre services or uh, FTTP, for example, uh, as part of that delivery? Yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned earlier that um, indications are that full fibre will 
be uh, quite a prominent technology in rural areas. Um, it will obviously be quite expensive in some areas, so suppliers will obviously uh, potentially look to introduce some flexibility within that. But I think it is important at times when I, I think we're guilty of it as well that we talk about the R100 programme very much about 30 megabits per second. Um, but I think it's important to recognise that that's a minimum. That the vast majority, I would I would guess, of premises that are connected will get speeds in excess of that. Indeed, even within the DSSB programme of those um, premises that are, are currently receiving super fast speeds, I think the average speed is about 60 megabits per second through that programme. So it's by no means just everyone will get a flat 30. And I think obviously full fibre technologies, you know, support um, you know ultra fast speeds of, of kind of 300 megabits plus. Um, so I, I think that will be um, quite a prominent technology in the R100 mix. Again, at this stage, it's very much subject to the outcome of the procurement process. But we, we obviously know that there are a variety of, of other superfast technologies that are out there and could be utilised by suppliers as they see fit. But, but certainly, you know, the deployment of fibre, I think, will underpin um, the vast majority of the, the R100 rollout. So in, in that vein, do you know which uh, percentage of uh, households uh, at the end of the R100 process, we'll have access to super fast or ultra fast speeds above 30%. As any modelling, uh, 30 megabits, has any modelling been done on that forecast-wise? Well, I mean, I guess the nature of the R100 program is such that all premises will be able to access 30 megabits per second um, by the end of 2021. Um, we have obviously done um, modelling, which has kind of informed the process to this point about the types of outcomes that the initial procurement could could deliver. Um, but obviously, at the moment, with the procurement ongoing, it's probably not a, uh, a particularly wise um, decision to, to share that, where I'm sure suppliers will be, be interested. But clearly, we hope that with competition through that process, that we'll even outstrip some of those modelling assumptions that were made at the time around what we might expect for the, the level of investment through the procurement. Thank you. Uh, the panel might be aware of a number of uh, existing uh, UK government initiatives aimed at increasing full fibre across uh, the UK, including the Digital Inf Infrastructure Investment Fund, the local full fibre network programme and the Challenge Fund. There's around £600 million of funding in there. Uh, is the Scottish Government aware of those schemes and participating in uh, any of that funding or any of those initiatives? Uh, yes, so we're obviously aware of the, the schemes. I mean, we hosted, for example, in the local full fibre networks partnership, uh, a local authorities uh, workshop with the UK government in December. Um, it's, I mean, clearly there are um, a number of elements to those schemes. They appear to be a bit less targeted in nature, so they're quite demand-led. Um, there's obviously some voucher elements within that for SMEs. They're trying on various different things. So at this point, we don't know what the widespread deployment of those funds will be. Um, but, but clearly, we want Scotland to, to benefit from that, uh, from, from all those funding streams. And we're aware and we're supportive of a number of local authority bids to, uh, to the UK government, particularly around the, the local full fibre networks fund. And we've obviously, we're supporting bids for the 5G element of that fund as well. Uh, through the, the Scotland Innovation Partnership. So, so clearly we, we think, given the, the kind of unique challenges that have already been spoken about, that Scotland's got a really, really strong case to, to benefit from that investment. I think just to illustrate that, um, and for the benefit of the rest of the committee, there's, a, I, I believe, a UK government trial in Aberdeenshire around full fibre as part of that, as one of those initiatives. Is that That's an example right, yeah. of it? It is. Okay. Um, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary, um, in a letter to us, Responding to a question on the draft budget for this year, um, uh, we wrote about the broadband voucher scheme. And uh, if I could quote your response, it says, we anticipate that our £600 million investment through our 100 procurement will deliver fantastic coverage. However, we are also planning for the possibility that this may not entirely complete the job. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what he meant by that? Uh, and also provide more detail as to uh, any potential future phases, uh, as you quote in your letter, um, it, it seems to well, perhaps confuse uh, me slightly in terms of I thought the R100 was 100% coverage, super fast by 2021. What are these future phases and in what way will the 600 million not finish the job? Okay, well, we, we expect the 600 million pound investment through R100 to deliver a fantastic uh, coverage outcome. That's our clear expectation. I mean, it's an enormous amount of money, and it's been divided into uh, amounts which uh, have, have been set by reference to the perceived need in cost in various, in the three different areas. 
Uh, we are planning for the possibility that, uh, I mean, we, we, will ha we will see what each of the, the bidders put forward. There will be a dialogue with that, uh, with each bidder in order to determine the preferred bidder and then move towards acceptance. That is the process, and until that process is complete, I mean, by definition, convener, it's not possible to know what the bids will be, but the whole process is designed so that the bids do as much as possible. You know, that is the aim. We are looking for the bidders to reach as many of those who haven't got access as is possible and uh, using a preference for fibre uh, to be, be applicable. Um, but there is the, the possibility that this will not complete the job and we are scoping options, therefore, for future phases, which may include a super-fast voucher scheme. So I don't think conceptually there is really any confusion you know, whatsoever. We want to reach as many parts as possible, as many homes and businesses as possible. There's a very large amount of money set aside. There's been um, a rigorous process uh, worked out. It is now being applied. Uh, a large team of professionals is working on this. Uh, it is a very complex procurement, but the aim is to reach as many as possible by fibre uh, within the timescale. And competition between the bidders, I think, will therefore push coverage as far as possible, and it could remove the need for any subsequent phases. But at the moment, it's not possible to say that for certain. We have to see what the uh, bidders come forward with. And therefore, because of that, we are scoping a scheme, a voucher scheme, how that would work. And this is informed by our experience, Mr Green, of the Better Broadband Scheme, which has been ministered on behalf of the UK. Um, uh, if it is needed, a voucher scheme, of course, would not by definition be in place until 2009 at the earliest. However, uh, because obviously we have to wait until we see what the bids are and the bids are accepted before we can ascertain whether it's necessary to have a second scheme. In the meantime, and this is the last thing I'll say, Convener, uh, uh, the Better Broadband Scheme does offer an interim solution and it offers connection vouchers to people who cannot currently receive two uh, megabits per second. And this scheme, as members may know, was recently extended until the end of 2018 and it's a reasonable option for people who want an interim solution aiming to get customers up to speeds of a minimum of 10 megabits per second. Um, Mr Johnson. If I could just add one further point on that, um, we are preparing for the possibility that additional interventions may be required alongside the initial procurement, but please, that should not be taken to mean that those are after 2021. The commitment to deliver 100% by, by the end of 2021 is a firm one. So if additional activity is required alongside the procurement, then that would also be delivered by the end of 2021. So the 100% by 2021 is a firm commitment. It may not be entirely delivered by the main procurement. Further activity may be required, but it would happen over that same time scale. Okay, so if I could just clarify then. Uh, Jeremy, if sorry. I could ask you to be relatively quick on Very this brief, one. Very uh, brief, just to summarise. So the, the tender process, the procurement process, may not deliver the 100%, but the, the backup is that there may be some sort of voucher scheme, which is uh, in addition to the better broadband current voucher scheme. That's correct. Yes. So, yes. so the, in, in effect, the, the procurement does not double as the programme. The programme may contain other elements, uh, elements other than the initial procurement. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Right, the next question is John Mason. Thanks, Convener. Um, my understanding is that in the rest of the UK, England, Wales, they're looking at some kind of rates relief uh, for fibre investment. And I have to say, whenever I see the word relief, uh, I think of loopholes and I think that perhaps local government would lose revenue. So, so can the Cabinet Secretary maybe tell us a little about what the government's thinking is about whether there should or should not be rates relief at all in Scotland? Um, well, the, the Scottish Government's new growth accelerator deal will offer one year's non-domestic rates relief for all new fibre laid from the 1st of April this year. And we have committed to matching the UK Government's non-domestic rates relief scheme on new fibre for future years, subject, however, to confirmation of what the, the detail is. We can't confirm anything until we know uh, what the, the details are, obviously. So uh, we are working with the Futures Trust and Industry with the aim of developing a scheme which is effectively targeted at incentivising new fibre build in, in underserved areas. Uh, and the government would be confident that, that wouldn't be abused or that there wouldn't be room for loopholes uh, in that? Um, well, I, I think to answer that question generally, I mean, business rates 
are pretty difficult tax to avoid uh, in terms of uh, the scale of avoidability of taxes. I mean, the thing about business rates is you're, ta you're, you're providing a tax for the occupancy of premises, and premises are fixed, they're there, they can't be shifted or taken to the Cayman Islands, you know. So, uh, <laughs> so generally speaking, I mean, you know, companies go bust and they don't pay rates and there's unpaid bills, that, that's something that no, no government can, can entirely prevent, but, uh, but a, you know, in general, they're, they're a tax. I mean, the, the rates are levied on, on lit fibre only, that's fibre being used by an operator. Um, fibre laid but unused, that's unlit, is not rated. So, you know, for those aficionados of the rating system, there might be scope to probe down into this a bit more clearly, just to make sure that there aren't any um, a inadvertent, unwitting attempts to hoodwink a, the assessors and the rates collectors, and maybe it's something that my officials could therefore look at, because I think it is a serious point and, and one that we always have to bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The next question is from uh, John Finney. Uh, hey, Kevin, I'd, I'd like to ask about cyber security and resilience and um, refer briefly to the Scottish Government's latel, latest digital strategy, um, realising Scotland's full potential in a digital world. And that promised that Scotland's critical national infrastructure would be secure and resilient against cyber attack. <coughs> Can you outline how the Scottish Government monitors the resilience of digital infrastructures fixed and mobile, please? Um, well, I think you know, Mr. Finney raises uh, an extremely important point. I think, and we, we've, we've, we have, uh, from memory, in the many, many appearances I've made before this committee, I think we have opined on this uh, before. But certainly, the cyber threat is is very serious, and nothing more serious, really, than uh, breaking into IT systems. There's been uh, lots of examples recently of commercial players, of public sector, the health sector, aviation companies. This is very, very serious indeed, and I think. It's up to all of us to observe good practice in our security passwords and so on. Not, you know, don't don't choose your daughter's Christian name. You know, this might be a good example. Uh, you know, we we need to kind of, uh, which I must admit I used to do some years ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, no longer though I stress. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think all of us have a responsibility, and I, I think also the, the sophistication of the attempts at fraud are now so sophisticated that. You know, people can provide emails to us all that may look as if they come from government or public bodies and need to be very carefully scrutinised indeed. And the, the programme for Scottish Government does commit us to work with the National Cyber Resilience Leaders Board to develop a suite of five, and I'm reading here as you can probably determine, five action plans which will drive Scotland forward to our vision of being a world leading nation in cyber resilience by 2000. And 20, and there's lots of work that is being done, as you would expect, by the police in that regard, uh, and others as 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 well. But I, I didn't. I, I must not come here with a full preparation about this particular aspect. Maybe I should have, but uh, but maybe we could come back to it if if it's within our purview, convener, in due course. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. And the final question uh, on this session is from John Mason. Hey, thank you, uh, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you had written to the convener uh, about the effects of Brexit and a whole range of issues in there, including digital connectivity. Um, I think a couple of points that were raised were as to what the UK regulatory framework would be when we lose the European framework, if we are going to lose the European framework. And also a lot of people would be concerned about mobile roaming charges within Europe if we were to, um, when we do leave the EU. Are, are these your main concerns, or are, is there any assurance at all around these areas, or have you other concerns about Brexit as well? Um, well, we think the telecoms industry does seek certainty and predictability on these um, things, and, and actually these, you know, certainty and predictability about regulation determine what costs will have to be incurred by investors, and therefore, if there's not certainty or predictability, that can and probably does impair, delay, push to the right investment decisions. So these, these are very, very important matters. And uh, I would certainly welcome clarity because we haven't had assurances uh, from the UK a, a government on whether the regulatory framework for telecoms will differ from the European framework. And that sets the parameters of the way Ofcom regulates at the moment. So we don't know that, and nor do we know, uh, have, nor have we had assurances on whether UK consumers will continue to avoid mobile roaming charges uh, post 
Brexit, I do remember that it was supposed to be independence that, that would involve us having roaming charges. Now it seems that uh, it's Brexit, uh, funnily enough. There we are, how things change. Uh, but uh, no doubt this matter may be covered in some of the papers that the UK government haven't released uh, recently. So um, maybe I'm the wrong person to be asking. Maybe it's Mr Hancock. You could always invite him, I suppose. Thank you. Um, sorry, J Jamie, did you have a follow-up? It's a point, not a question. Yeah. May I? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Peter. Can I just... Uh, unfortunately, today, we're very tight for time. We didn't really get to touch much on the cyber security aspect of, I think, what's an important uh, part of the digital strategy. Uh, I think given that Scotland was pit particularly hard in the recent attack, the NHS in particular, as were many other organisations across the world, um, could I ask uh, or make a request that the... Cabinet Secretary and his, his team uh, provide more detail on the preparedness of the Scottish Government on such cyber attacks. I think that's an area we perhaps could have gone into in more detail or may, may do in future sessions uh, as a flight request. Well, uh, you know, I'm in the committee's hands. I think it's a perfectly reasonable request, Convener. I mean, I do think that there are key officials who are involved in this that are not really here today, and it probably would be useful if I might respectfully suggest that this, this be looked at, at, at separately. But it, by, I don't abs absolutely don't uh, downplay anything that Mr Green has said. I think we all recognise that um, cyber crime, whether it's cyber enabled crime or cyber, cyber dependent crime, there are two types, uh, are extremely serious threats. And uh, you know, the more we talk about it, I think the more people might think about just uh, protecting themselves by changing their password is the most, the most basic step that everybody, I think, can, can take. Cabinet Secretary, I think the uh, cyber resilience actually covers other portfolios as well. So yeah. I think it'd be very useful if you could uh, consult with your colleagues and maybe write to the committee and let us know what, what, what is being done. I think it would be extremely helpful. Um, okay, Cabinet I'll do that. Yep, I'll do thank that. you. Cabinet Secretary, that, that brings us to the end of this session. I'd like to thank you and your officials, Alan and Robbie, for coming to this meeting. And I am now going to suspend the meeting as, as we move into private session. Thank you.